We begin our program today with Damian Goggins, one of the most talented graduates of the Cleveland Classical Guitar Society's Arts Mastery Program.
And now, please welcome to the stage, Chris Gorman, Chairman and CEO of Kiko. Well, it's just uh, great to see everyone. What an outstanding, outstanding performance. Can we just give another round of applause for Damien? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Gorman, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of KeyCorp. It is my distinct privilege to welcome you to the 2023 Cleveland Foundation Annual Meeting presented by KeyBank. KeyBank has deep roots in the greater Cleveland community, and we are just so proud of our longstanding relationship with the Cleveland Foundation. Since 2014, KeyBank has proudly sponsored the Cleveland Foundation's Annual Meeting. I'm just so impressed with how big this meeting is, it's great. We're thrilled to be part of this year's meeting. Uh, it's such a pivotal time for the foundation as it opens its doors to its new headquarters in Midtown and prepares for a historic leadership transition this summer. Ron Richard will retire after 20 years at the helm of the foundation and Lillian Curry will become the organization's 10th president and CEO. Both the Cleveland Foundation and KeyBank have navigated many seasons of change over the course of our 109 and 198 year histories, respectively. Through it all, we share a commitment to serving the community today and for generations to come. Our shared commitment to serving the community is why we named the KeyBank Studio for Arts and Community in the Cleveland Foundation's new headquarters which offers accessible spaces for dance classes, performances, and other types of programming right on the building's first floor. Many of you have probably seen it. We look forward to enjoying the space this very Saturday, July 15th, celebrating the opening of the foundation's new headquarters with community performances in the KeyBank studio as a sponsor of the Midtown opening day block party. We certainly hope to see all of you there. Now, as we continue the program this afternoon, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the Cleveland Foundation Board of Directors, Connie Hill Johnson. Connie? Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so grateful to KeyBank for your partnership with the Cleveland Foundation and your support of this event, as well as your sponsorship of our community block party on Saturday. This is an exciting day as we return for our very first in-person annual meeting in more than three years. I'm exceedingly thrilled that we can be together in person again. Everyone who is here at Severance Music Center or tuning in via live stream shares a commitment to the greater Cleveland community and an interest in the Cleveland Foundation's work. I'd like to recognize the current and former Cleveland Foundation board members who are in the room this evening. Could you please stand to be recognized? Thank you so much for your leadership and stewardship of this wonderful organization. It has been an honor and a pleasure working with all of you. I would also like to acknowledge the foundation's donors, the individuals, families, and organizations whose generosity and partnership with the foundation are making a difference in our community. We are also joined today by representatives from many nonprofit organizations across greater Cleveland who are working on the ground to meet the needs of greater Clevelanders and to advance opportunities in our community. Thank you for all that you do. And we are also thrilled to have a number of elected leaders joining us today. Thank you for your leadership on behalf of greater Cleveland residents and our region. Today, we celebrate all that we have accomplished together as we look ahead to what's next for the foundation and greater Cleveland. Indeed, there is so much to celebrate, including Ron Richards' remarkable tenure as he prepares to retire later this month. And we have a bright future to look forward to as Lillian Curry prepares to come on board as the foundation's next president and CEO. 
In this time of reinvention and renewal, the foundation's guiding light continues to be its mission to improve the quality of life for all greater Cleveland residents, now and for generations to come. In service of this mission, we must continue to bring a lens of equity and inclusion to all that we do. As the community's foundation, our organization and work must reflect and celebrate the diversity of greater Cleveland. It is an incredible honor to serve as chairperson of the Cleveland Foundation's Board of Directors. And in this role, I am fortunate to work with the many talented leaders and staff who carry the Foundation's mission forward on a daily basis. Today, however, there is one person whom I would love to recognize. For two amazing decades, Cleveland Foundation President and CEO Ron Richard has led the Foundation with integrity, courage, and vision, and he has laid a solid foundation for what comes next. In a moment, Ron will deliver his State of the Community Address. But first, I want to share a video reflecting on his leadership, which features several people who have worked closely with Ron during his tenure. I would describe Ron as a very caring person. Ron has a big heart for this community and for people. And at the same time, he's a visionary and innovator. When Ron came to Cleveland, he didn't come out of philanthropy, but he was probably 10 to 15 years ahead of all of us in his thinking about advanced energy, thinking about how to invest in the community, and really being invested in economic development and the growth of people. Under Ron's leadership, the Cleveland Foundation has been instrumentally involved in shaping the economic development ecosystem for Greater Cleveland. They have supported all the major Renaissance projects in the city that made Cleveland what it is nowadays. They opened windows and doors into the world. That's the support that's important for Cleveland to become hopefully a global city in the full term of the world. The philosophy that Ron has that the diversity in the board and also among the staff and employees of the foundation need to really represent the diversity of the community. Ron's leadership has meant growth in the community. It's meant the inclusion and diversifying leadership, making arts education and arts mastery important, balancing out an education for any child. And that's what really excites me in terms of what he's meant to this community. We've been, of course, the recipients of major grants. The foundation was a key partner in making the renovation of Severance Music Center possible. Ron's a visionary. I think he's always looking for the big picture, for the long term. Someone who's been very accessible. He's been a wonderful partner. The Cleveland Foundation is not only a funder, but Ron Richard and others have been thought partners. Even beyond that, they've been doers. They've rolled up their sleeves and helped do the work that has led to the great educational reforms that we've been able to implement over the past decade or more. When he speaks, people listen, but he's not trying to dominate the rooms that he's in He's always trying to create space for others to be able to express their perspectives. It's a great leadership style because it's very inclusive. Ron Richard has always been a mentor to me ever since I met him. You can look across our community and see executive directors of nonprofits, members of the mayor's cabinet, all sorts of folks doing really important work in our community. And the Cleveland Foundation invested in each and every one of them. When I look around this community, I see Ron Richards' impact with what's going on with the hospitals, the Evergreen Project. I see it with reentry programs. I see it with Newbridge. Violence and eruption, which is so important. The Peacemakers Alliance, arts and culture, the new building. 
The foundation's move to the Huff neighborhood is around legacy. And when you talk about the Cleveland Foundation, a community foundation, now in the heart of the community, that is his legacy. His legacy will be one of a person who cares, who loves the community, who loves people, and who wants to do what's best for everyone involved. As he prepares for his next chapter, Ron leaves an incredible legacy at the Cleveland Foundation and in the community. Now please join me in welcoming him to the stage. You keep that up, you're going to see a grown man cry. <laughs> Thank you, Connie, for the very kind introduction and video. It was heartwarming for me to see so many dear friends and colleagues reflect on our work together. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm overjoyed to be here with all of you, our esteemed public officials, beloved members of my immediate family and my Cleveland Foundation family, with so many partners and friends of the foundation, my friends, many of whom I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for two decades. This is a nostalgic and poignant event for me as it is my last annual meeting as president and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation. This role has been the greatest honor and pleasure of my 43 year professional life. And I will greatly miss working with the amazing people my staff and board, our donors and grantee and community partners who all make the foundation's very significant impact possible. When my family and I arrived in Cleveland in 2003, the city was experiencing some really tough times. Euclid Avenue downtown was mostly boarded up from just past Playhouse Square to Public Square. The legendary department stores had all closed and the news headlines lamented the city's so-called quiet crisis of economic and population decline. The city seemed really down on itself, dispirited and pessimistic about its future. As a newcomer to the area, I must say I had a very different view. Like so many newcomers, I was impressed with Cleveland's assets, our museums and theaters, arts organizations, world-class healthcare institutions, our fine regional colleges and universities, our abundant natural resources, including of course our lake and rivers, as well as our outstanding parks. Furthermore, I was heartened by the vibrant spiritual life of Cleveland with our welcoming churches, synagogues, temples, and mosques. And in every neighborhood I visited, I met residents who possessed an indefatigable spirit and determination to succeed. They were proud of their neighborhoods and proud Clevelanders as well. So it was easy to see the exciting, almost limitless possibilities for Greater Cleveland if we could build on our region's strengths and history of innovation while fostering an inclusive and equitable economy, revitalizing our neighborhoods and transforming our public schools. Being at the Cleveland Foundation, I knew I was in the right place to support these possibilities. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan foundation, which didn't have to concern itself with quarterly earnings reports or election cycles, we could take risks, we could test new ideas and commit to multi-year, even decades long projects and initiatives to address intractable but important issues for the benefit of all greater Clevelanders. But nothing is possible without a great team. So I felt the first order of business was to retain and recruit the very best staff at the foundation so that together, under the guidance of our wonderful board of directors, 
and in collaboration with many partners across the community, we could build on the success of the talented and passionate foundation staff and leaders who had come before us. We wanted nothing less than to help restore a spirit of optimism for Cleveland. Together, I believe we've achieved that goal. Our work is never done, never will be done, and our community, like so many others, continues to face very serious challenges. But there is a sense of hope and momentum for our future that the next generation of leaders will carry forward to realize new possibilities for our region. Our work over the past 20 years has laid a solid foundation for accelerated progress. Please allow me to recap some of those successes for you now, as well as a few lessons that we've learned along the way. Our top priority when I joined the foundation was education, since education in one form or another is the basis for all success. Since its earliest years, the Cleveland Foundation has believed in the power of public education. While our approach has changed over time, our commitment has remained the same. In the early 2000s, Cleveland schools were in fiscal and academic emergency, and the public had lost confidence in the district. Recognizing that you cannot have a strong city without strong public schools, we formed a very special partnership with the George Gunn Foundation in collaboration with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, CMSD, to develop a portfolio of 26 new and innovative redesigned high schools, such as the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. This was the beginning and a key cornerstone of the systemic approach that has characterized our education strategy ever since. The success of these high schools helped pave the way for the next and most important step in this journey. Through close alignment with Mayor Jackson, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Breakthrough Schools, the Greater Cleveland Partnership, and the Cleveland Teachers Union, we developed and passed the Cleveland Plan for Transforming Schools to ensure that every child in the city would have access to high quality preschool, enrollment in a great high school, and the opportunity and resources to pursue higher education or career technical education. Since the adoption of the Cleveland Plan in 2012, local organizations and leaders have continued to come to, uh, together through intermediaries, including Pre for Cle, the Cleveland Transformation Alliance, and the Higher Education Compact, all significantly and consistently supported by the Cleveland and Gunn Foundations to accelerate and improve academic and social outcomes. In 2019, our community worked collaboratively to bring Say Yes to Education to Cleveland, raising almost $100 million of the $125 million goal to provide scholarships that will ensure that CMSD graduates for the next 25 years will be able to afford the education needed for a successful career. Our foundation donated a single grant of $40 million to Say Yes which was four times larger than the largest grant we had ever given in our history. I think that speaks volumes about the priority we place on public education. <laughs> Recently, we've also supported efforts like PACE, CMSD's sixth through 12th grade career exploration and planning curriculum to help every student graduate with a career vision and a plan for next steps, whether that's continuing their education, entering the for workforce, or both. During the past 20 years, in support of our investments in education, we also created or supported new social service programs aimed at removing impediments for students and their families, such as MyCom and its myriad of exciting out-of-school time recreational programs, anti-violence organizations like the Peacemakers Alliance, housing initiatives like the Lead Safe Home Fund, Right to Counsel Against Eviction, and other efforts to combat homelessness, maternal health initiatives such as Birthing Beautiful Communities, and a wide array of efforts serving special needs populations, including schooling, housing, job training, and placement, just to name a few, because we understood that conditions outside the classroom 
have a direct impact on student academic achievement and overall community well-being. This is why wraparound medical and other support services in every school are such an important part of Say Yes Cleveland. Taken together, our investments in public education and related social services have produced unprecedented results. The number of Cleveland children enrolled in high quality preschool seats increased by 72%. CMSD high school graduate rates increased by nearly 30 percentage points with rates for black and Hispanic students exceeding the state average by six percentage points. And for all CMSD graduates, four-year college degree com completion increased by over 50%. Yeah. Through all of this, we've learned that it takes an entire community working together in a sustained way to improve educational access and outcomes for future generations. There are no quick fixes and there are no magic bullets. And while this has all been very much a team effort, I must take a moment to acknowledge the unparalleled leadership of the district's former CEO, Eric Gordon, As you clearly all know, Eric was the vital force behind this progress, and I am thrilled that he will continue his commitment to Greater Cleveland students in his new role at Tri-C. I also want to commend, and I know Eric would want me to do this as well, the Cleveland Teachers Union and our dedicated teachers and school administrators for the critical role that they played in public school reform. The pandemic was devastating to schools and students across the country, and that is true here in Cleveland too. But thanks to the progress we made before COVID struck and the incredible supports in place through Say Yes Cleveland, we're in a solid position to recover faster than our peer districts. With Dr. Warren Morgan as the district's new CEO, I'm excited and confident about the prospects for continuing the progress that we've made. In addition to public education, we simultaneously focused on Cleveland's arts and culture landscape because the arts are central to a good quality of life. Art in all its forms contributes to our joy and fulfillment as human beings. It also contributes to our tax base. A local creative economy employs more than 54,000 people, and that number was even higher before the pandemic. Moreover, arts education builds confidence, perseverance, and creative thinking, even for those who don't aspire to a career in the arts. This is why the arts should not be the first subject to be eliminated when school budgets are under pressure. The arts are also a major attractor of talent in other sectors. Our hospitals, universities, and companies are able to attract world-class talent because of our arts and cultural institutions. During the past 20 years, the foundation has made historic grants to our region's world-renowned cultural institutions, including single grants of $10 million to the Cleveland Orchestra in 2013 and $2 million to Karamu House in 2019. Throughout my tenure, we've also granted a total of roughly $6.5 million to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and $10 million to Playhouse Square. And at the same time, we've devised new ways to promote small and mid-sized arts nonprofits and opportunities for individual artists and creators. Through these efforts, we've learned how important it is to support the entire arts and culture ecosystem from the high-profile institutions that make Cleveland a cultural destination to the neighborhood arts organizations that are innovating, connecting with the next generation of creatives. 
Our Creative Fusion International Artist in Residence program, which we launched in 2008, has brought more than 90 accomplished or rapidly rising artists from around the world to Cleveland, where they've connected with local artists, organizations, residents, and students. Turkish whirling dervish dancers, a Pakistani sculptor, a composer from Rwanda, and a digital artist from Taiwan are just a few of the examples of the talent that this program has brought to our backyard. For our students who don't have the financial wherewithal to travel the world, we have brought the world of arts and culture to them. Another new initiative that we created, and I must say, one of my all-time favorite grant-making investments during my tenure is our Arts Mastery Program. Since 2016, we've granted more than $12 million to local arts nonprofits to fund nine very high-quality programs in a range of disciplines, dance, vocal arts, photography, theater, guitar, orchestral music, writing, curatorial arts, and more. Today, nearly 5,000 students in 18 neighborhoods across the city are being served by this portfolio of arts mastery programs. Damien Goggins, who opened our program this afternoon, is one of several talented artists who've achieved excellence and who show us what's possible when we invest in young people. Damien started studying classical guitar with the Cleveland Classical Guitar Society, one of the organizations in our arts mastery program when he was in eighth grade. Five years later, he received a full ride to the Oberlin Conservatory and is on track to graduate in 2025. And I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to make a totally shameless pitch for some generous art-loving donor to endow our Arts Mastery program <laughs> so that we keep it, can keep it going strong and expand it to even more neighborhoods. <laughs> In order to reach more talented students like Damien. Sorry, but you know, 20 years of fundraising, it's hard to stop. Yeah. Okay. During these past 20 years, the foundation has also focused our attention on neighborhood and economic revitalization with the understanding that vibrant neighborhoods and access to economic opportunity are necessary for a strong community. One of the first major projects that we undertook when I joined the foundation was the Greater University Circle Initiative. This was a bold anchor institution strategy that brought together partners like Case Western Reserve University, university hospitals, and the Cleveland Clinic as well as public agencies like the Greater Cleveland RTA and the City of Cleveland to promote equitable investment and development in neighborhoods surrounding University Circle. The Greater University Circle Initiative demonstrated the catalytic power of anchor institutions, large nonprofit organizations like hospitals and universities that are physically rooted in communities. The lessons we learned in Greater University Circle are now informing our investments in Midtown and Huff, Buckeye Woodhill, Clark Fulton, and other neighborhoods all across Greater Cleveland. Our strategy in Greater University Circle involved physical developments, like the creation of the Uptown District along Euclid Avenue, to finally provide a main street for Case and UH. At the same time, we invested in economic opportunities for area residents, including the launch of the Evergreen Cooperatives, a collection of five for-profit but employee-owned businesses, and Newbridge Cleveland, a center offering free workforce training programs as well as after-school arts classes. Now in its 14th year, the Evergreen Laundry alone employs more than 180 people with locations in Collinwood and Glenville. Meanwhile, hundreds of residents have launched promising careers as phlebotomists, sterile equipment processing technicians, and medical assistants thanks to the programs at Newbridge. In fact, the last three times that I have had my blood drawn at one of our local hospitals, the phlebotomists who worked on me had all been trained at Newbridge. One of them shared with me that she had been homeless and living in her car while she went through the program, and that she was only able to receive the training because it was free. But thanks to Newbridge, she has a job, a lovely apartment, and is taking courses now to become a nurse. 
Her story is exactly Thank you. Her story is exactly the kind of life-changing impact that we'd hoped for when we established Newbridge in 2009. I should mention that we modeled Newbridge after the wildly successful Manchester Bidwell Arts and Career Trading Center in Pittsburgh. Manchester Bidwell's legendary founder, MacArthur Foundation Genius Award winner Bill Strickland, my very dear friend, traveled from Pittsburgh to be with us today. So Bill, Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for being here and for all you've done for society, both in the US and abroad with your Manchester Bidwell franchises. In terms of economic development more broadly, we must invest in innovation if we want to achieve significant growth and we need to work collaboratively towards shared goals. Economic growth is mostly reliant upon the private sector, of course, along with good public policy and cooperation from government. But the foundation has made many valuable and catalytic contributions in this critical area. The Cleveland Foundation has played a major role over the past few decades in the launch and ongoing funding for economic intermediaries and incubators such as Jumpstart, Bioenterprise, Nortec, Team Neo, Magnet, the Great Lakes Energy Institute and Center for Proteomics and Bioinformatics, both at Case Western, as well as the Cleveland Innovation Project and the Greater Cleveland Career Consortium, all of which brought together business, education, nonprofits, and government to align their work towards shared and highly targeted goals. As we work to fuel our economy, it's vital that we also prioritize sustainability and climate resiliency. Climate change is an enormous and existential global problem, but we can and we must contribute to its mitigation locally, and we can't afford to wait. As I've often said, if we don't address the climate crisis, none of our other work will matter much in the long run. During my time at the foundation, we've made significant investments to pave the way for advanced wind and solar energy projects in Greater Cleveland and supported the creation of a microgrid for the city and county that can safeguard our communities from cyber attacks or disruptions to the national grid. Recognizing that accessible parks and green spaces make a community healthier and more attractive place to live, the foundation has also granted millions of dollars to preserve and transform public parks and recreational, recreational areas, including the renovation of Public Square in the heart of downtown Cleveland, the creation of the Nord Family Greenway connecting Case and the Art Museum to Huff, and the completion of the Lake Link Trail connecting the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath to the shores of Lake Erie. The community can rest assured that we will always be committed to the stewardship of our region's outstanding natural resources. And in order to have a bright and prosperous future, we need good leadership. Very little progress occurs in this world without it. Investing in the development and mentoring of Cleveland's future leaders has been a top priority of the foundation throughout my tenure. We established the Coro Cleveland Executive Fellowship in 2004 and the Cleveland Foundation Public Service Fellowship in 2016, while also expanding the reach of the Foundation's traditional summer internship program for college students. In addition, we've been consistent and strong supporters of the American Marshall Memorial Fellowship and the National Urban Fellowship programs. All these programs have been aimed at turbocharging the careers of young people and emerging leaders with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion so that they can serve our society in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. To date, more than 650 people have participated in our leadership development programs. Across our entire region, we have a new generation of leaders taking the reins, and they have a track record of working very well together. There is new dynamism in our public sector at both the city and county levels, as well as our nonprofit sector including our major health systems and universities. 
With the fresh perspectives and energy from brilliant new leaders, combined with the wisdom, experience, and insights of our seasoned anchor institution and corporate leaders, we have a special moment now to propel Greater Cleveland forward. To conclude my opening remarks, let me say that I am extremely optimistic for Greater Cleveland's future, and I look forward to seeing all of the great things that will occur at the Cleveland Foundation in particular, and in the city more generally during the next decade and beyond. No one knows for sure what the future will bring, but the one thing I know for sure is that the Cleveland Foundation will remain an organization committed to continuous renewal, reinvention, innovation, and trailblazing, all for the benefit of our beloved community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Each year at our annual meeting, the Cleveland Foundation presents the Homer C. Wadsworth Award to a local leader who demonstrates creativity, ingenuity, risk-taking, and good humor in the service of community. These are the qualities that defined Homer Wadsworth, who served as the executive director of the Cleveland Foundation from 1974 to 1983. I'd like to recognize Homer's family members and members of our ward committee. Thank you for helping us celebrate Homer's legacy each year. Now it is my pleasure to present the 2023 Homer C. Wadsworth Award to Felton Thomas, Jr., Executive Director. <laughs> For the few of you who don't know this, Felton has served as the Executive Director of Cleveland Public Library since 2009. Since beginning his tenure at CPL, Felton has promoted the library's mission to be the People's University by launching initiatives to address community needs like digital access, education, and economic development. Felton has expanded the way that we think about the role of libraries, not just as repositories for books, but as welcoming destinations for all members of our community to access the information and resources they need to navigate their lives and further their opportunities. So Felton, congratulations. So I know what you're all thinking. How did the librarian win? All right. Well, I, I want to thank so many people, Ron, and you know all of the board for the foundation. Um, you know, I, I want to thank Connie and Lillian, who will, who have made history for this city. I want to thank our board of the Clean Public Library. Um, Trustee Tom Corrigan is here. Said he had met Homer Wadsworth, and he said. The thing to know about Homer was anytime he went out, he tried to make people feel better about themselves, feel good when he ran into people, and I hope I do that. But I recognize that I'm not here for that. I'm here because the folks who work in our libraries, our 600 plus staff members are out every day trying to make everybody's lives better, right? And so I want to thank them. And then finally, I never get a chance to thank my wife who,
who continues to make sure that I don't go off the rails. And of course, my two daughters, one of which you will see tonight performing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cleveland Foundation. Thank you, everybody on the selection committee. Let's get a picture with you. Thank you, Felton, for your leadership and for all you have done for this community. During my first year at the foundation, I think about the first 10,000 people I met in the community all started our conversation by telling me that I had very big shoes to fill. And that was most certainly true and highly motivating. Hi, Robin. Now, as I prepare to step down as CEO, I can say with confidence that my successor, Lillian Curry, will step into this role with ease and with a minimal learning curve. She won't need to worry about big shoes to fill because she's been in key leadership roles at the foundation for 18 years with a long list of accomplishments, including playing a pivotal role in our move to Midtown and Huff. And I cannot imagine, I simply cannot imagine a better person to lead the foundation in its next era. So kudos to Connie and the board for selecting her. I know that Lillian will take the foundation in new and highly creative directions and to new heights in her own way with her own leadership style and I will be her biggest cheerleader from the sidelines. It is now my great pleasure and honor to invite the Foundation's next CEO to the stage. Thank you, Ron. I am excited and honored for the opportunity to lead the foundation as the next president and CEO. I want to thank the foundation's board of directors, including Chairperson Connie Hill Johnson, for their leadership and support of me. The foundation's board is an exceptional, diverse group of people. Even as we navigated some of the most challenging times in world history in the recent years, this is not a board that contracted. They moved the foundation forward in catalytic ways for the benefit of our entire region. As I prepare for my new role, I stand on the shoulders of the foundation's leaders who've come before me, and especially the 20 years of Ron's extraordinary leadership. He has put the foundation in a position of strength. We are poised for incredible growth and impact in this next chapter. I personally want to thank Ron for his mentorship and for giving me every opportunity to grow as a leader. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with so many friends, colleagues, and supporters. I want to thank my family who's here today, my two brothers, Phil and Steve, and their wives, Camille and Michelle, and my two children, Sydney and Mason. They motivate me every day to try to make the world better, and they and their generation live their values and give me so much hope. I've been thinking a lot about the future of Greater Cleveland, and I've been inspired by so many people and places across the community, including a few unexpected places like baggage claim at Cleveland Hopkins Airport. <laughs> I was returning from a trip recently and waiting on my ride when I heard Mayor Bibb's voice come across the loudspeaker, welcoming travelers to Cleveland, the land of possibilities, 
That struck me because it reinforced my thinking about what's possible for our region and for the future of philanthropy. For 109 years, the Cleveland Foundation has evolved and adapted to meet the changing needs and opportunities in Greater Cleveland. In many ways, the Foundation is a platform for possibilities. We work together with donors, nonprofit organizations, elected officials, and community partners to imagine and realize a brighter future for Northeast Ohio. Looking ahead to the Foundation's next chapter, we will build on our position of strength. We will continue to grow our impact and embrace a culture of renewal, reinvention, and shared responsibility for the community. At this moment in Northeast Ohio's history, I am convinced that by coming together through collaboration and cooperation, we will generate hope, inspiration, and the energy to achieve things previously thought unachievable. By leading together, we can make this happen. Our new headquarters and the collaboration in Midtown and Huff are an important part of this future. As we prepare to open our doors to the community this Saturday, I want to share a video that tells the story behind this project and features just a few of the countless people who made it possible. Well, I arrived in Cleveland in 2003, and of course we were in Playhouse Square in the Hanna Building, the 12th and 13th floors. We had catalyzed Playhouse Square, and we we're all very proud of that. I thought someday when our long-term lease is over, it might be nice to catalyze another part of town and to build a building specifically designed for the Cleveland Foundation. When we made a decision that it was time to move out of the Playhouse Square area, after a lot of due diligence, we picked this Midtown Huff area, an area that has historically been redlined, a lot of disinvestment. We knew that this was a good community to plant seed in. It was the connector between University Circle and the downtown. And if we could be successful in revitalizing this area and create new jobs and new vitality, we would be unifying a city. I was so fortunate, and the board was so fortunate, to have Lillian Curry and Roseanne Potter on the staff at the same time. Without those two women, this building would simply not exist. We used no grant-making dollars in order to fund this building. This is a mission-related investment, an investment that has not only a financial return, but also a social return. There is no better social return than investing in Midtown, and it truly aligns with the mission and purpose of the foundation. It was really exciting to be part of something that would provide so much benefit beyond extending their mission, beyond grant making, and provide a real foundational support to the community that needs the money the most, at the same time really transforming the neighborhood in a really profound way. So in designing the building, we really wanted to take to heart the Foundation's goals of community, accessibility, transparency, and sustainability. It was very important for us to have intention in the way that we're engaging the community because it really was a project that's serving the community, which was quite unique to be able to work with the group where the decisions are centered around people, around a mission, and around creating a stronger and better world. Throughout this entire process, the community engagement that has happened here is genuine. Residents are at the table, so that means that their enthusiasm for it is real. I appreciated the opportunity to meet the architect, to have conversations with what the space was gonna look like, how it was gonna be used. They were so intentional about talking directly to community leaders and residents in the neighborhood and really envisioning alongside the community what this building and larger vision could be. They are not here to save us, but they're here to work with us and support us. And I'm excited about that. The entire west side of the first floor is community space. 
We have an entrance on Euclid, a cafe that opens up onto the street. We have windows that open entirely that allow activity to go inside and outside. Neighborhood Connections was just such an important grantee on the corner. And a dance studio that can be accessed from the street. This idea of using all four sides of the building to really add to the life and vitality of this district. I'm so proud of the staff. Every single member of the staff participated in this building in one way or another. It bespeaks everything we care about, the love for the arts, the environment, love for community and social service delivery. And it was really a tremendous team effort between every member of the staff and every member of the board. We're already building building number two next to us. And seven important institutions are coming in to deliver services for the neighborhood. We believe that coming here is really about this larger vision of what's possible over the next 20 or 30 years. When we set out to design our headquarters, it was important to us that we not only work with the most excellent team at S9 Architecture in New York and Vocon locally, who could deliver the very best design, but who also understood that our vision was to build something that was more than just a building. This building, like the foundation, is a platform for possibilities. And now we're opening our doors to new relationships, new partnerships, new ideas, new investments, and new ways of working together as a community. This is the reason why we chose to work with Pascal Sablon, who will join me in a conversation this year as the Sally and Bob Grease keynote lecturer. Pascal is a trailblazer, and she has dedicated her career to making the built environment more equitable and just. Pascal is the global president of NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, and the fifth woman to hold the position in the organization's 52-year history. She is also the founder of Beyond the Built Environment, a nonprofit that celebrates the contributions of diverse designers and advocates for equitable communities. Among her many accomplishments, Pascal is the 2021 AIA Whitney Young Award recipient, becoming the youngest African-American architect to join the College of Fellows. And she is only the 315th licensed black female architect in the US. She is breaking barriers, inspiring the next generation, and she is one of the most influential architects of our lifetime. Now please join me in welcoming Pascal Sablon to the SAGE. Welcome, Pascal. <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, I have to say, uh, it's been one of the greatest honors of my lifetime to work uh, with Pascal over the, the last five years and to get to know her. Uh, I think you're in a, for a real treat today about uh, what she, her journey, and what she's been able to accomplish as such a young uh, <laughs> architect uh, here. So. Um, so we're going to open with a few questions, um, and we'd like Pascal to start uh, by telling you uh, how she is both an architect and an activist. Um, tell us about your journey. It's a really extraordinary journey, becoming an architect, uh, and, and how that brought you to the profession. Thank you so much, Lillian, and thank you all for being here. So for me, I was always an artist as a kid. Uh, I was commissioned to do a mural at the Palmanac Community Center when I was 12 years old. And as I'm drawing this jungle gym with a multifaceted community, a passerby says, well, you can draw straight lines without a ruler. That's a cool skill for an architect to have. And if this stranger had not had this out loud thought, really, I'm not sure when architecture or the design profession would have ever been offered to me as a pathway. So anyone who's ever known me will have no told you 
that any time anyone asked me what I was going to be, the answer was always an architect. So I was intentional about going to Pratt Institute that had a five-year bachelor's degree because then finally, after six years of impatiently waiting, I can begin to study the profession that I knew was destined to be my future. And within the first or second week of school, in an architecture history class, a professor asked two of us to stand. And what we did, we thought we were being, you know, volunteered to lead an activity or a program. And he said, okay, these two will never become architects because they're black and because they're women. Now, this surprised me that a professor who didn't know my name nor my capacity could make such a strong proclamation about my intention and what I, my capabilities. It was also shocking to understand in a classroom of 60 students that there was only two black women in the space. And I was also saddened by the silence of my peers. But that's also the moment where I received my purpose. I knew when I walked into the space, I was representing way more than Pascal, right? I was representing my gender, my race, my ethnicity, those with curly hair. I mean, I was representing it all. And that weight and that responsibility, knowing that my actions and how I perform was supposed to multiply the opportunities that are afforded to me and not limit for the other. And so when I think about that weight, when I think about that responsibility, that's why I knew when I came into the architecture profession, I cannot just draw buildings and amazing projects, but I also needed to transform the profession as well. It's important that when I tell that story, a lot of you are shocked. But I've asked audiences to stand if they have ever been told that they're inadequate because of those things, and people are standing in schools of architecture, in professional settings, and lectures. And what you're seeing on your screen here is actually me asking an audience in Cleveland, Ohio to stand if they've ever been told. So this is systematic. Ah, my girl. <laughs> Thank you for persevering. But this is systematic. This is part of the narrative. And as we fight, especially in architecture, to have a more diverse and inclusive profession, we need to understand where are these roadblocks, these obstacles. And part of my path and my journey is to eradicate racism, sexism, and all forms of oppression from the profession and the built environment. And I thank you, Lillian, and the Cleveland Foundation for your leadership in allowing me to do so in this project. In addition to being an architect, Pascal has stepped up to lead, including creating her own nonprofit called Beyond the Built Environment. Can you talk about the organization and why you created it? Sure. So the mission behind Beyond the Built Environment is to elevate the work and identities of women and people of color in the profession, while letting the community know their important role in designing and deciding their built environment and experience. So together with programs such as Say It Loud, uh, we have exhibitions, which is a traveling activation that elevates the work of local heroes. So every time we have a new exhibition, and we're working on our 38th one right now, uh, we elevate those work and identities, and we have that all kind of have a repository in the Great Diverse Designers Library. Now you're saying, well, wow, Pascal, great, that's a strong word. Yes, it is. Because when we Google the words great architect, Google Banner comes up with 50 names and faces that start from contemporary currently practicing architects all the way to Raphael and Michelangelo. And how many are women? One. So are we saying there's only been one important woman in the field of architecture between now and when architects were Ninja Turtles? Absolutely not. <laughs> so with all these exhibitions, everyone who's ever been elevated is now in the great diverse designers library and their bios begin as such. We are fighting that SEO with every single uh, exhibition and each profile indicated. And in this moment, we're at 972 diverse designers featuring 70% of the US and 10% of the global world. And so what we've done with this exhibition is really transform not just having gallery spaces, but accessible spaces where the community can engage. And some of the images you're seeing here is also local to Ohio. And that's important because really we're talking about the pipeline. You can't be what you don't see. And to see people in your community go, wait, I know that project. That project impacts me every day and can see yourself reflected in the identity of those designers and can go to their lectures or can come visit them at their headquarters 
or be able to go see them uh, speak. This is all important, tangible ways of connecting future leaders with local heroes, and that's part of that mission. Thank you. <laughs> one, one of the reasons why also uh, we selected uh, Pascal and wanted to work with her is because she has been championing an idea of design justice. And uh, talk about what that looks like in practice and why it's important to the work you do. Sure. So before I can convince you about design justice, I have to talk about what design injustice can look like, right? Our environments impact who we are and how we function. It tells us stories. It gives us very strong and clear messages from bright orange spaces that says get up and go to blue and green tranquil spaces that says relax and take a deep breath, right? So an example of that is Robert Moses. Robert Moses, in my education, was heralded as a prolific person who really transformed New York. And what I did not know, what my education failed to uh, tell me, is that he was an avid racist. Not just against people of color, but immigrants. We were all considered undesirables. And while he was developing Jones Beach, he did not want us to go to his prestige Jones Beach. So he made sure that all of the overpass bridges on the Southern State Parkway was nine feet or shorter. Why? Because he knew that our main mode of transportation at that time was buses. And so we have over 20 overpass bridges that is the manifestation of his racist ideals. And so these are moments where it's not necessarily obvious that there's messaging within our built environment, but it's there. It's there in statues, heralding at the highest peak of communities of people who fought vehemently to maintain slavery and oppression. It's there in typologies that imprison and maintain the slavery pipeline. It's in many aspects. And so when we talk about design justice, it's about architecture that heals, that acknowledges history, that embeds culture, that apologizes in a tactile, meaningful way. And so we think about projects that tell stories that sometimes we're uncomfortable with, but is the reality of our history and part of our identity of how we sit and stand before you together. And so why that's really important, because it's not just the beautiful structure at the end that we take really good selfies with, but it's the process in which we do it. It's how we teach, it's how we engage, it's the people we engage in that process that's quite important and critical in how we share that story and realize justice. Because it's not designing for people, it's designing with people. And making sure that their voices is not just at one or two community meetings with some cold pizza and some flat soda, but throughout the entire process. And in those spaces, their voices are valued, are echoed, are protected, and the responsibility of all of us collectively around the table, decision makers, are heralding what they're telling us and pushing that forward as we make decisions for the project. So since sometimes it's hard to see this in a finished building, talk about the process here in Cleveland uh, and how your work to help us radically rethink the program of the Cleveland Foundation uh, manifested itself and really the values of how we really work together to create this building. First, it began with connecting with the employees with the staff, understanding how they work, how they want to work, and what their aspirations are as team building. Then it was also the community. Who the client is is beyond who cuts the check. It's everyone impacted by the project. And really making sure that our approach really diversified who the important voices are and expanded the definition of what a stakeholder is and what it means. Across platforms, across the community, across ages, abilities, educational levels is all important. Your voice, your presence, your interaction with this project is important. And through that, we developed together our project, right? This amazing project that had program and spaces really that is for the community, that kneels to the community and says, this is for you. The project is extremely contextual and cited on this site. If we moved it a whole block over, the project would have to have a different design. Because this site has history that is manifested. The material selection is part of that work. And when we engage the community, especially the tech hive is actually very much that stays with me, is that we had a moment of vulnerability where we not just talked about what we were excited about, but also what we were fears. What were the hesitations? 
And that level of trust and vulnerability cannot be pushed aside for a different color choice. It's important that we kept that as our, our mission in terms of how we make the decisions. And as an activist architect, it was powerful to have a partner in the Cleveland Foundation who already understood the mission, who are activists and advocates as well. And so together, we revolutionized the way we do architecture, and we offered that to the Huff community, to the Cleveland community, and to the global community on how we can do work that really expands that. And with doing that work and to hearing those voices, the level of accountability and our reputation to the community is important, because that also is part of that healing process. Not everything that was asked for was manifested, but it was circled back. Here's what we heard. Did we hear that correctly? Here's why we can or why we cannot do this. And that is important to, again, continue that option of actionability and showing up for people in a way that they need to and how it's healing. And so I'm really proud of our process and even floored by the ultimate event of how our project have come together. Thank you. Um, in addition, uh, Pascal gave up her time, uh, incredible amounts of time, uh, beyond uh, even the scope sometimes. And she spent time with the Huff uh, Youth Advisory Council uh, and really inspired them to think about the neighborhood as a whole and their own potential uh, leadership in designing our city. And so talk a little bit about what that meant to you to work with the youth. So I think it was, thank you for the very generous words, um, but I think we really inspired one another. Right? And when we talk about stakeholders and who our leaders are, students and youth is absolutely part of that equation. And I was inspired to see how passionate, brilliant, and talented the youth is in your community and how lucky you all have that as your trajectory. And what was powerful for me is that I was very honest. I talked about the challenges. I talked about the skill sets. I talked about the strategies of becoming an architect. Uh, designer and planner, but really I emphasize architect, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but really pushing the idea for them to understand that. And they take on that mantle and talk about how they wanna manifest those changes in their everyday lives. So when, again, as we talk about community and we talk about engagement, it's really about meeting everyone at those capacities and really thinking about the youth as part of that aspect. So volunteering and having engagement with youth is really a blessing for me and something that I also always inspire to do because it has such a prolific impact. Ron was talking about you know, the programs that he had put forward through the support of you all and seeing that come back to him in, when, in time of need. Right? You never know the, plant, the seeds you're planting today Oh, the beautiful trees that are soaring to a great heights tomorrow. Um, and it's not always about knowing what the impact will be, but moving with intention, moving with uh, vulnerability and honesty as we create and impact people, because we never know how strong our impact are to people. Thank you. Talk about what it means to be the 315th licensed black female architect in America. Uh, and the fifth woman to serve as the president of NOMA, which is the National Organization of Minority Architects. Um, and in addition, Pascal is a mother with a young child. So how do you hope your leadership for the field uh, and for the world will, will impact the next generation? Hmm. For me, it began with self-love and really identifying. I always kind of leaned and hid behind the ambiguity of my name, Pascal. And really, quite recently in, in 2020, reconciled my identity and stopped hiding behind that. I altered my bio so that that is the first sentence. If there's anything about that first sentence that does not sit well with you, do not continue to read. We do not need to hang out. <laughs> I also point out that I'm the fifth woman president of NOMA because it is literally an organization founded to seek justice. And so it's to say that all organizations have an opportunity and a need to grow and to be better. That we all have biases within that work, so then how do we start to dismantle that on all levels? And so first was stepping forward with my identity, making that be part of my handshake. It was also allowing my hair to be poofy and curly sometimes, that it doesn't necessarily need to subscribe to flat iron, pressed and permed hairs that subscribe to that European idea of beauty. That me, as I am, is beautiful. Once I realized that, <laughs> once I realized that, I was able to be more present and more full. So I didn't have to leave parts of myself at the door. 
when I came into a boardroom, when I came into an architecture firm, when I came into an advocacy space, and instead chose to bring as much as me forward as possible. So my son, poor Xavier, comes to me to board meetings, <laughs> panel discussions. He does all the hand gestures. It's very quite funny. Um, but, and he said that he's going to be a Noma architect when he grows up. And so that's your, what I shared on the screen here is a picture of him sitting at an eight-hour board meeting talking about with the other anchor institutions of architecture about really creating DEI in this space. And it's important that people see me in that way. And when I left, one of the women said, wow, Pascal, you coming with your son made me know that I can actually have a family and be a leader. And so again, just sometimes just being me allows me to send a message and echo something that is quite important that resonates with others. And that's important. And I also understand as a leader that it is not about my personal experience only. That I represent thousands of people in the various hats that I wear. And so when I make moves or make decisions, it's impacting a lot of people. So it must be carefully considered, but it also must be an echoing voice that I'm hearing from those that I serve as well. So moving with intention, with integrity is quite important to me and making sure that I'm very careful to ensure that I understand the important information, that I'm generous with the information that I have and share those resources so that we can move together. My leadership style is not to live in the mindset of scarcity that there's only one seat at the table or that there's even one table, but that we live gloriously in a place of abundance. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Removing all shackles that hold us down and elevating one another. And just imagine, imagine the power, the space, the world we create together equally. Thank you. So to close, one final question. Um, how might the work that you did in Cleveland, I mean, reflect a little bit on the work here in Cleveland uh, and the future of cities and, and what lessons uh, we've learned together, um, but that we think uh, really apply to the future of cities? I mean, first, I think Navid Makami, who was our leader in this process. Um, and the kind of grace and power that he gave me to kind of come forth and bring that kind of level of engagement and our process in the project. And although I love the global impact and world domination, I'm also quite proud of the local impact and imprint that it has made as well. Using the lens of design justice, of a project that heals, not just through um, you know, words and banners and posters, but through spaces, square footages, transparency, glass, Right? When we talked to the community and asked about what they wanted to see, they wanted to see themselves. They wanted to feel welcomed. They wanted to know that this was for them as well. They also had really great programs established and didn't want to overshadow those things, but identified the gaps that was needed and necessary for the project to fill. So with that work, that sculpted the decisions and the, the ground floor most exclusively, but also even the materials, the wood, that says warmth, that says nature, that says sustainability, that says, touch me, we're here. We wanted to make sure that it's applied for not just, again, working for people, but with people in a way where they feel that their voices are being heard and respected. And we're also always expanding the idea of who our clients, our stakeholders, and our community um, means. Because sometimes there's identities and challenges that I don't identify and don't even see and understand and perceive. So having a diverse group of professionals and students and uh, community members as part of the table really brings as much insight as possible. And through all things, architecture can make amazing things happen as long as we know about them. So for me, this project is catalytic. This is an amazing thank you moment to allowing what I've been advocating for and pounding the podiums about to have it manifested in a real tangible way and to show and to hear the love that the community has given to the project because it has realized a lot of the promises I've made, we made together, is also quite important. I am excited to continue to engage the community because that doesn't just happen during the design process or during construction, but it's through the life of the project as well. And so we need to always have an ongoing dialogue because architecture, when you're looking at plans, sections, elevations, it is a specific language that only a few of us speak. 
And when you don't speak a language, it's very hard for you to participate in the conversation. So we want to make sure that our architecture is the Rosetta Stone that tells that story, that speaks to those histories and those legacies, that manifests Hoff and the community of Midtown. And you see it, you feel it, you are in love with it because you see yourself and it manifests even more self-love in this amazing community. Thank you. So thank you, Pascal. I'm going to ask you to thank her again for both this conversation, but for what she's done for us and for our community and for a lifelong uh, friend and partner to Cleveland. So join me in giving Pascal a round of applause. Thank you, Lillian and Pascal, for that just amazing, beautiful, interesting, inspiring conversation. I will think of you, Pascal, with great fondness and gratitude every time I drive by or enter our new headquarters. In a moment, we'll close our annual meeting with a special performance by the incredibly talented students in Tri-C's Arts Mastery Program. But first, I want to take this opportunity to express my deepest appreciation to some very special people who've made my life so rich and joyous these past 20 years or longer. I'd like to thank all of the board members, especially the board chairs, whom I have had the honor of working with and for since my first day on the job. You treated me like gold with affection and respect, and more importantly, you performed your duties superbly and diligently for the benefit of the community. You allowed the foundation to take bold risks and make bold investments beyond anything that I might have expected. Your trust in me and the staff was a gift that we simply cannot repay. I can't thank you enough. I'd also like to thank all the members of my wonderful, lovely, amazing staff for your hard work, dedication, creativity, altruism, and constant support. You are the finest people I have ever worked with, and I will miss you terribly every day, but I will carry you in my heart wherever I go forever. I'd also like to express my deep appreciation to our wonderful donors. Without you, there would be no Cleveland Foundation, and it has been an honor to help you and your families fulfill your philanthropic goals. Of course, I want to express my respect and gratitude to all of our grantee partners and other community partners. You are the ones in the trenches doing the hard work. We do most of our work through you and with you. You are the secret sauce of the Foundation's success. I'd also like to thank all my loyal friends in this room and my family. I'm especially overjoyed that my wonderful brother, Mike Richard, my hero, my mentor, my best friend, and his beautiful, funny wife, my sister-in-law, Anna Orcasitas Richard, are here to celebrate with us today. Your presence means the world to me. I know you know that. And I wish the rest of my family could be here too, especially my sweet, feisty, and always intellectually curious 93-year-old mother, Annette Richard, who unfortunately is not able to travel anymore, and our wonderful son, Nick, who wanted to be here very badly today but could not get leave from the Foreign Service introductory course at the State Department. In a few short months, Nick will be posted overseas as a U.S. diplomat, and we couldn't be more proud of him. Yeah. 
nor could we be more proud of his sister, Susanna, who has the purest heart and who fights valiantly for every ounce of success that her autism will allow her to have. Bess and I were delighted to make a gift to name the cafe in the Cleveland Foundation's new headquarters in Susanna's honor. Susanna's Cafe. <laughs> Susanna's Cafe, which has the best coffee in Cleveland, which is now open to the public, is operated by the Help Foundation and employs local adults with developmental disabilities. We want it to be a celebration of Susanna and the entire disability community of Cleveland, who are all cherished members of our society. And last, but certainly not least, on July 31st, the foundation will lose two of its key leaders, me and my wife, Bess Rodriguez Richard, who has also devoted 20 years of her life to the foundation as its first lady, while being the most devoted and amazing mother in history to our two children, and serving the community in many other capacities, including, for example, as the volunteer painting teacher at the Cleveland School for the Arts for several years. Bess has played a key role for us in her authentic and sincere relationship building with my board, our staff, our donors, almost all of all the community leaders in all sectors, and as my chief informal advisor, consoler, booster, and muse. For 20 years, Bess has attended every major foundation and community event, despite the fact that this greatly interfered with her career as an artist and forced her to constantly juggle her parenting responsibilities. It wasn't at all uncommon for her to be out with me three or four times a week, year after year after year, as we represented the foundation at community events or attended the foundation's own events. And throughout our entire 39-year marriage, Bess has played a significant role in helping me climb the career ladder. I would not have had this job at the Cleveland Foundation without her support, and I would not have succeeded to the extent that I did without her at my side. So Bess, I wanna thank you for all you've done for me, our children, the Foundation for Cleveland, and I so look forward uh, to our new adventures together in this next very active chapter of our lives. And I know that you hate the limelight, but I'm gonna be a jerk and ask you to please come up to the stage. <laughs> I wanted best to come to the stage. <laughs> I'm going to catch hell tonight. Um, so that Connie, on behalf of the board and the past boards, and Lillian, on behalf of the entire staff and previous staff, can offer you a token of their respect and appreciation for your service to the foundation. We would now like to welcome to the stage the Tri-C Creative Arts Academy.
director for the Mogul Ops Master Pro. It's your time now. I want everybody that sings soprano or everybody that sings tenor to stand up on your feet. Everybody that can sing soprano or tenor, stand up on your feet. Come on, don't be shy. Soprano or tenor. Soprano or tenor, come on. And, and this is what I want you to sing. Listen up. All right, soprano. That's all I want you to do. Come on. It's gonna be. A Come on, I can't hear you. It's gonna be. A Come on. It's gonna be. One more time. All right, give him a cloud. You can take your seat. Take your seat. All right, all right. Altos and basses. Anybody that's saying alto or bass in the choir? Alto and bass. Alto and bass. All right, this is what I want you to do. Here we go, sing it. Altos and basses. Thank you, you were wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for attending the 2023 Cleveland Foundation Annual Meeting presented by KeyBank. We hope to see you again soon.